Welcome to Evergreen Tactics Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Evergreen Tactics Podcast. Today we're going to be talking in a more philosophical point of view than a business and marketing, but we will return to our regular scheduled uh, broadcast after this. But I, w- I was reading this uh, book by Leo Tols- Tolsty, Tolstoy, I don't know, but it just was so profound and so powerful, and it answered the age-old question, what is the meaning of life? And he just did such a good job of laying it out there that I have to talk to somebody about it. So, here we go. The thing that I love about the article, okay, I recommend anybody just Google Leo Tolstoy, uh, The Meaning of Life, and you'll be able to find what I'm talking about, but he's just so honest and so true in his mission to figure out the purpose of life, but he's also very cynical, (laughs) and he, he realizes in the beginning that there are so many things wrong with living, that living is just suffering, and the suffering increases, and it just keeps on going, and the only salvation is death. And this is a quote from him. Today or tomorrow, sickness and death will come. They had come already to those I love or to me. Nothing will remain but stench and worms. Sooner or later, my affairs, whatever they may be, will be forgotten, and I shall not exist. Then why go on making any effort? How can man fail to see this? And how go on living. That is what is surprising. One can only live once. One is intoxicated with life, but soon, as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all a mere fraud, a stupid fraud. That is precisely what it is. There is nothing either amusing or witty about it. It is simply cruel and stupid. So this is just the beginning of his rant but it's so true. Like, I feel... Like, I, I consider myself pretty well-read. Like, I basically screwed my life. Screwed the pooch in the beginning of my life. And I did all kinds of crazy shit, but I, I hit rock bottom. And I decided that I was just going to read a book every day. And I have. And when you begin to read, you know, you, you really get a new perspective on life. But... So much crazy stuff happened when I was just ignorant to the world, to the way things work. Like when I was just completely ignorant and I just let life happen like like a dog, you know. And then I started reading all these books and I, I became a ferocious reader. And the more I learned, I felt like I was growing. I felt like I was expanding in so many ways. I'll never stop learning, but... It did get to the point where I I felt like I had read so much about life and still no answers. It it almost does feel like sometimes like the purpose of life is nothing. It's just fucking stupid. Things happen. We don't know why. So he goes on, uh, Leo Tolsky, to go into philosophy and science, and religion, to try and find the real answers of the purpose of life, and I just could relate to this so, so amazingly well, and I have to share the next quote with you. He goes, my question was the simplest of questions, lying in the soul of every man, from the foolish child to the wisest elder, it was a question without an answer, to which one cannot live. As I had found my experience, it was, what will come of what I am doing today or shall do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Differently expressed, the question is, why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? I can also be expressed thus, is there any meaning in my life? 
that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy. Damn! <laughs> he just brings the heat. And don't worry, it will get slightly more <laughs> uplifting. But it, it stays pretty dark and cynical for a little while. Here's the next quote. There are all words with no meaning. For in the infinite, there is neither complex nor simple, neither forward nor backward, nor better or worse. One who sincerely inquires how he is to live cannot be satisfied with the reply, study in endless space the mutations infinite in time and in complexity of the innumerable atoms, and then you will understand your life. So also, a sincere man cannot be satisfied with the reply, study the whole life of humanity, of which we cannot even either know the beginning or the end, which we do not even know a small part, and then you will understand your own life. He just drops the mic right there. Seriously, though, I've, I've read so many books trying to figure out how to be happy, trying to figure out what to do with my life. And, and I really thought back in the day when I started reading these books, I mean, I was reading great books, though. You know, I was reading Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence Others, uh, Seven Highly Effective, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The E-Myth. Like, these are just a few books that were really opening my mind, right? And I just kept digging. I, re I read it, a whole bunch of Nietzsche, and I read lots of the old philosophical books, and I just kept digging and digging, and I was praying and hoping I would find answers, you know? I studied philosophy, I studied science, you know, I studied black holes. I, I, I learned so much, but I, I still never really got the answer I'm looking for. And it's because the answer is so stupid. There is no answer. There, in science, we try and study it, right? And it just goes smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's an even smaller piece inside of this smaller atom inside of that, you know? And it just keeps going infinitely, right? And then you try and look into space and it just keeps going infinitely. You even can meditate and you can try and find the infinite inside of you. And it just goes on infinitely. It's insane because... We are just strange creatures in a giant world. And we can do all the science to try and figure out. There's nothing wrong with science. Science is glorious. Don't ever think I don't approve of science. But when we're trying to figure out the purpose of life, science doesn't necessarily give us the answer. It gives us more questions, if anything. So Tolstoy moves on from science and he becomes to take a look into philosophy to see if he can find the answer to the purpose of life. And this is a quote from him. Philosophy not merely does not philosophy not merely does not reply but is itself only asking that question. And if it is real philosophy all its labor lies merely in trying to put that question clearly. Instead of an answer, he finds in philosophy the same question, only in complex form. He bemoans the inability to either science or philosophy to offer a real answer. Another quote. One kind of knowledge did not reply to life's question. The other kind replied directly, confirming my desire, indicating not that the result at which I had arrived was the fruit or air or of a diseased state of mind, but on the contrary, that I had thought correctly and that my thoughts coincide with the conclusions of the most powerful human minds. He gets frustrated, all right? And he goes, why does everything exist that exists? And why do I exist? Because it exists? That's <laughs> just so powerful. Such a powerful line. Why does everything exist that exists? And why do I exist? Because it exists. Like, there's just so much to unpack. And it's just so ridiculous of a question. But it's so true. 
Like, do we exist because everything exists or does everything exist because we exist? Like, are we, you know, there's always those theories, like it's all an illusion or whatever. And (laughs) I feel like everybody has had that question, you know, throughout their life (laughs) as things go, you know. So Leo uh, Tolstoy goes on from science and philosophy and tries to find some reasoning he, he dives into Buddhism as well as Christian Christianity. Um, and he, he found among them, you know, the, the different spiritual and religions, there are four strategies for managing the existential despair, but none that resolve it. And then here's a quote. I found that for people of my circle, there were four ways out of the terrible position in which we are all placed. The first was that of ignorance. It consists in not knowing, not understanding, that life is an evil and an absurdity. For people of this sort, I had nothing to learn. One cannot cease to know what one does not know. The second way out of this Episcopalianism, I don't know what that means. It consists, while knowing, the hopelessness of life, in making use of meanwhile of the advantages one has disregarding the dragon and the mice the licking and the honey in the best way especially if there is much of it within reach that is the way in which the majority of people in our circle make life possible for themselves their circumstance furnishes them with more of welfare and than of hardship and their moral dullness makes it possible for them to forget that the advantage of their position is accidental, and that the accident that has today made me a Solomon may tomorrow make me a Solomon slave. The dullness of these people's imagination enables them to forget the things that gave Buddha no peace, the inevitability of sickness, old age, and death, which today or tomorrow will destroy all of these pleasures. The third escape is that of strength and energy. It consists in destroying life. When one has understood that it is an evil and an absurdity, a few exponentially exponentially strong and consistent people act so, having understood the stupidity of the joke that has been played on them. And having understood that it is better to be dead than to be alive, and that it is the best of all not to exist. They act accordingly and promptly end their stupid joke, since there was means, a rope around one's neck, water, a knife to stick in one's heart, or the trains on the railways, and the number of those in our circle who act in this way become greater and greater, and for the most part, they act so at the best time of their life, when the strength of their mind is full bloom, and few habits degrading to the mind have as yet been acquired. The fourth way, out of that weakness, it consists in seeing the truth of the situation, and yet clinging to life, knowing in advance that nothing can come of it. People of this kind know that death is better than life, but not having the strength to act rationally, to end the deception quickly and kill themselves. They seem to wait for something. This is the escape of weakness. For if I know what is best, and it is within my power, why not yield to what is best? The fourth way was to live like Solomon, knowing that life is a stupid joke played upon us, and still go on living, washing oneself, dressing, dining, talking, and even writing books. This was, to me, repulsive and tormenting, but I remained in that position. Finding himself in the fourth category, Tolstoy begins to question why he didn't kill himself. Suddenly he realizes that a part of him was questioning the very validity of his depressive thoughts, presenting a vague doubt as to the certainty of his conclusions about the senselessness of life, humbled by the awareness that the mind is both puppet and puppet master, he writes. It was like this. I, my reason, 
have acknowledged that life is senseless if there is nothing higher than reason, and there is not nothing that can prove that there is, then reason is the creator of life for me. If reason did not exist, there would be for me no life. How can reason deny life when it is the creator of life? Or to put it in another way, were there no life, my reason would not exist. Therefore, reason is life's son. Life is all. Reason is the fruit, yet reason rejects life itself. I felt that there was something wrong here. That's so cool, though. The idea that reason is life's fruit, but reason defies even life. Like, that's just such a crazy concept to think about. And he discovers the solution, not in science or philosophy or the life of hedonism, but in those living life in its simplest and purest form. The reasoning showing the vanity of life is not so difficult and has long been familiar to the very simplest folk. Yet they have lived and still live. How is it they all live and never think of doubting the reasonableness of life? My knowledge confirmed by the wisdom of the sages has shown me that everything on earth, organic and inorganic, is all most cleverly arranged. Only my own position is stupid. And those fools, the enormous masses of people, know nothing about how everything organic and inorganic in the world is arranged. But they live, and it seems to them that their life is very wisely arranged. And it struck me. But what if there is something I do not yet know? Ignorance behaves just in that way. Ignorance always says just what I'm saying. When it does not know something, it says that what it does not know is stupid. Indeed, it appears that there is a whole humanity that lived and lives as if it understood the meaning of it of its life. For without understanding, it could not live. But I say that all this life is senseless, and that I cannot live. Whew. A lot to unpack there. I mean, it's just so dope. Oh, I can't wait for you guys to get to the end. <laughs> okay, this is like, awesome. So, in the delusion of my pride of intellect, it seemed to me so undoubtable that I, the Solomon, had stated the question so truly and exactly that nothing else was possible. So undoubtable did it seem that all those millards consisted of men who had not yet arrived at an apprehension of all the profoundity of the question, that I sought for the meaning of my life without it once occurring to me to ask, but what meaning is and have been given to their lives by all the millards of common folk who live and have lived in the world? I long lived in this state of luxury, which in fact, if not in words, is particularly characteristic of us, very liberal and learned people. But thanks either to the strange physical affection I have for the real laboring people, which compelled me to understand them, and to see that they are not so stupid as we suppose, or thanks to the sincerity of my conviction that I could know nothing beyond the fact that the best I could do was hang myself. At any rate, I instinctively felt that if I wished to live and understand the meaning of life, I must seek this meaning, not among those who have lost it and wish to kill themselves, but among those millards of the past and the present who make life and who support the burden of their own lives, of ours also. And I considered the enormous mass of those simple, unlearned, and poor people who have lived and are living, and I saw something quite different. I saw that with rare exceptions, 
all those millards who have lived and are living do not fit into my division and that i could not class them as not understanding the question for they themselves state it and reply to it with extraordinary clearness nor could i consider them epicureans for their life consists more of perversion and suffering than of enjoyments still less could i consider them as irrationally dragging on a meaningless existence for every act of their life as well as death itself is explained by them to kill themselves they consider the greatest evil it appears that all mankind had a knowledge unacknowledged and despised by me of the meaning of life it appears that reasonable knowledge does not give the meaning of life but excludes life while the meaning attributed to life by the millards of people by all humanity rests on some despised placido knowledge he considers the necessary ir irrationality of faith and contemplates his unfair ask of forsaking reason but let's let's unpack the last thing that happened i mean it's just so profound what he's saying it's like you 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 try and learn everything and reasons about life right and you get so smart and judgmental of other people who are just living their life and you for some reason think that you're better than them because you've learned more right whereas the basic humbleness of good old people who don't have the senseless knowledge in their minds that we do or i don't want to say we do but that that people of knowledge and so on have but they're happy as fuck right living their simple lives not asking the big profound ridiculous questions of what is the purpose of life but they live their life happy you know doing their own thing at least that's how i got out what i got out of it so but he goes on rational knowledge presented by the learned and wise denies the meaning of life but the Innumerous masses of men, the whole of mankind, receive that meaning in irrational knowledge, and that irrational knowledge is faith. That very thing which I could not but reject, it is God. One in three, the creation in six days, the devils, the angels, and all the rest that I cannot accept as long as I retain my reason. My position was terrible. I knew I could find nothing along the path of reasonable knowledge except the denial of life and there in faith was nothing but a denial of reason which was yet more impossible for me than a denial of life from rational knowledge it appeared that life is an evil people know this and it is in their power to end life Yet they lived and still live, and I myself live, though I have long known that life is senseless and an evil. By faith, it appears that in order to understand the meaning of life, I must renounce my reason, the very thing for which alone a meaning is required. A contradiction arose from which there are two exits, either that which I called reason, was not so rational as I supposed, or that which seemed to me irrational was not so irrational as I supposed. Oh, wow. I really hope I'm able to deliver this message to you so that you understand what he's saying. It's just so cool. I'm going to read that again. A contradiction arose from which there were two exits. Either that which I called reason was not so rational as I supposed, or that which seemed to me irrational was not so irrational as I had supposed. So he's going on about religion and how people that are super religious, you know, his reason goes against religion. Uh, angels and devils and God. And don't worry, I'm not getting religious on this episode or nothing. I'm just reading what he learned. And it's so profound. It's so cool to think, like, ignorance is bliss in a way. You know? If you are at all into, like, personal development and things like that, you realize, like, if you set the rules for your existence, then that's what's going to happen. If you live the simple life and 
you believe in what you believe, right? Or if you go into the complexities of everything, you can become overwhelmed and forget the simplicities of life. It's just crazy. But he says like, as he was learning everything, he got depressed and he realizes that life is evil. You know, it is in a way you have to kill to eat. You know, you are, we are all constantly consuming, but if you don't realize it, if you live that simple mentality, the simple life, you make your own rules in a way, it's just perfect as opposed to reason, which is difficult. (laughs) So he goes on and therein he finds the air in all his prior reasoning, the root of his melancholy about life's meaningless, verifying the line of argument, of rational knowledge, I found it quite correct. The conclusion that life is nothing but inevitable, but I noticed a mistake. The mistake lay in this, that my reasoning was not in accord with the question I had put. The question was, why should I live? That is to say, what real permanent result will come out of my illusionary transitory life? What meaning has my finite existence in this infinite world? And to reply to that question, I had studied life. The solution of all the possible questions of life could inevitably not satisfy me. For my question, simple as it at first appeared, included a demand for an explanation of the finite in terms of the infinite and vice versa. I asked, what is the meaning of life beyond time? cause and space and i replied to quite another question what is the meaning of my life within time cause and space with the result that after long efforts of thought the answer i reached was none in my reasonings i constantly compared nor could i do otherwise the finite with the finite and the infinite with the infinite for that reason i reached the inevitable result force is force matter is matter will is will the infinite is the infinite nothing is nothing and that is all that could result philosophic knowledge denies nothing but only replies that the question cannot be solved by it that for it the solution remains indefinite having understood this i understood that it was not possible to seek in rational knowledge for a reply to my question and that the reply given by rational knowledge is a mere indication that a reply cannot be obtained by a different statement of the question and only when the relation to the infinite is included in the question and i understood that however irrational and distorted might be the replies given by faith they have this advantage and they introduce into every answer a relation between the finite and the infinite without which there can be no solution so that besides rational knowledge, which had seemed to me the only knowledge, I was inevitably brought to acknowledge all live humanity has another irrational knowledge, faith, which makes it possible to live. Faith still remained to me as irrational as it was before, but I could not but admit that it alone gives mankind a reply to the questions of life, and that consequently it makes life possible. Tolstoy goes on and says, I understand that faith is not merely the evidence of things not seen, etc., and is not a revelation that defines only one of the indications of faith, is not the relation of man to God. One has first to define faith and then God, and not to find faith through God. It is not only agreement with what has been told one, as faith is most usually supposed to be, but faith is a knowledge of the meaning of human life, in consequence of which man does not destroy himself, but lives. Faith is the strength of life. If a man lives, he believes in something. If he did not believe that one must live for something, he would not live. If he does not see and recognize the illusionary nature of the finite he believes in the finite if he understands the illusionary nature of the finite he must believe in the infinite without faith 
he cannot live. For man to be able to live, he must either not see the infinite or have such an explanation of the meaning of life as will connect the finite with the infinite. And yet the closer he examines faith, the more glaring he finds the disconnect between it and religion, particularly the teachings of the Christian church and the practices of the wealthy. Once again, he returns to the peasants as a patron of, of spiritual salvation, of bridging the finite with the infinite, and once again seeing in their way an ethos most clearly resembling the Buddhist philosophy of acceptance, in contrast with what I had seen in our circle, where the whole of life is passed in idleness, amusement, and dissatisfaction. I saw that the whole life of these people who passed in heavy labor and that they were content with life in contradiction to the way in which people of our circle oppose fate and complain of it on account of deprivation and suffering these people accept illness and sorrow without any perplexity or opposition and with a quiet and firm conviction that all is good in contradiction to us who the wiser are the less we understand the meaning of life and see some evil irony in the fact that we suffer and die. These folk live and suffer, and they approach death and suffering with tranquility and in most cases gladly. In complete contrast to my ignorance, they knew the meaning of life and death, labored quietly, enduring deprivation and suffering, and lived and died, seeing therein not vanity but good. I understood that if I wished to understand life and its meaning, I must not live the life of a parasite, but must live a real life, and taking the meaning given to live by real humanity and merging myself in that life, verify it. So, that is what I read this morning, and I was like, what? What? I mean, I, I just love it so much. I don't know. I, I don't really know why, actually, to be honest with you. I just know that I have been endlessly searching for the answer to the purpose of life. Like, constantly. I, I dug deep in so many books, and I've, I've, you know, tried to ride the backs of giants and read everything and have mentors and stuff, you know. And it's like... Maybe to be complex and, like, overthink everything is not the way and the meaning of life. Maybe the meaning of life is just to appreciate the moment and work hard, you know, and, and just really dig deep into today and into a, a good willingness to live a real life, you know. Not not try and stand out from all the people that I judge as different or crazy or like, you know, so I'm just talking for myself, but I'm an entrepreneur and I always think people that have jobs are fucking stupid. No, no offense, but I just, that's my belief because, you know, I, the way I think of it is like one person can put you out on the streets, whereas for my business... I've got thousands of customers, and if they wanted to put me on the streets, they'd have to all do it, whereas you have one boss, and you don't work for yourself. But but there's also something so rewarding and, and comforting of having a job where you, you can just kind of show up and go through the motions or something, you know? And it's the same thing for life, though. It's like so many people just live very simple lives, and they're comfortable, and they're satisfied, I hope, you know, and they're not trying to just fucking own the world, you know, like, I, I always feel like I'm on such a, a big mission, and to do so many things, and, and I'm ne really never getting anywhere, <laughs> I don't think it is to live less, though, I don't, I don't think that's the purpose of life, you know, but what, what Tolstoy says is, you know, to be, to really find the meaning of life you have to not be a parasite but you have to live a real life taking the meaning given to live 
by real humanity and then merging yourself into that life to really feel alive, to be part of a culture, a tribe. You know, you have to kind of go go all in on on your clique, <laughs> your people, you know. See how they live. You can think different. We're still all confused. I'm sorry I didn't really give you the full meaning of life, but I think that's a good start. But I think it's just so profound the idea that you go into science, right? And you try and learn everything, but it's infinite, right? You go into philosophy and instead of giving you the answers, they just show you how important getting clear on the big question of everything is, you know, and then you go into religion and and your reason goes against everything in religion, right? Your reason is so strong. And, and, and so profound that how could religion be a thing, right? And then you try and go into religion and, it, and it, it, it just doesn't sit right. But the people that do have their religion, their peace with whatever happens in the world, they're content. They live that real life. I don't, I don't know how many people nowadays actually live that real life. I mean, I'm sure... I'm in America, so I'm, I'm like spoiled. I don't, I don't see like the, I guess there's like the good old boys, but I, I don't know. I, that just doesn't seem quite like what he's talking about. But I can picture it in my head, you know, like the people that work the farm and you know rice paddy fields or whatever, and, and that's their whole life, and and they they they're happy and and they, they take life as it comes and they don't try and get out of their comfort zone. I mean, it doesn't seem like what life is about, but it, at the same time, it's like if we make the story something not as crazy, right, as as the story that we have going on in our brains. If we simplify li- our lives, right, if we don't have to be like everyone on social media or we don't have to make everybody fucking happy and we just live a content, simple life without all the crazy shit that we make up with our reason. You know, if we just take a step back and try and make things happen that are real to us, then that's a good life. And that can be your purpose for life. That can be my purpose, is to simplify and just really merge yourself in to that beautiful life and not live the life of a parasite but live a real life and take the meaning given to live by real humanity and merging yourself with it all right guys that was long if you listened all the way to the end you're a fucking legend uh love you guys peace right now is the best time on earth to start a podcast I have personally been working on this course for over a year to make sure that I deliver you the highest quality course possible for creating a a podcast, launching a podcast, and monetizing a podcast. We did a heavy focus on ways to build your audience. And that's what I went into this because I realized that everybody has a message and people need to hear your message. So the most important thing for a podcaster is to be able to grow their audience and to know how to do it. And that's what I went into this course trying to figure out. Okay, how can I help people grow their podcast audience in the most efficient way possible? And what I discovered is going to blow your freaking mind. Okay, it has revolutionized my life and my podcasts and any, everybody that I've shared it with just how powerful this system to grow your podcast audience is. And I am so excited to finally bring it to the world. Go to evergreentactics.com and purchase the podcast promotion course.